Good, good morning, everybody. Um, I'm here to talk about a sprain survey and sprain analysis um, and the uses and um, limitations. This is a sprain of the Eurasian otter. Um, this is from obviously Scotland. This is an otter spraining, which you can see in the field quite regularly. So what is a sprain? It's obviously the dropping of an otter. It contains mucus, uh, fish scales, crab remains, bones, feathers, the, the skeletons and insects. Uh, in all sprains, we get all too evidence of small uh, mammals. But otters are deposited chemical the code on the sprain is really important. And a lady called Dr. Trowbridge from Aberdeen University, she found there was 300 different uh, uh, chemicals in this code. And she analyzed seven of them by an otter smelling. They could identify if it was male, female, young or old. And she speculated that they could identify individuals by smelling the sprint. And why is this? Because otters have a cribriform plate. Now this is a, it isn't really a plate, it's a cribriform uh, cavity that we don't have. So when an otter smells, it goes straight into this cribriform cavity, it's processed and the information is sent directly uh, to the brain. So sprain is so important. And you think, how can an otter identify an individual? Well, dogs have a cribriform uh, plate. And when we used to do strips out to Russia, we used to, Watch bears and the great wolves. And they had a, had a team, it was Pachinov who, who did the brown bear um, uh, research. And they had a team of KGB sniffer dogs and they could identify individual brown bears by smelling the dropping. So if they can do that, I reckon an otter, I mean, I haven't got any evidence, but I reckon an otter could probably identify an individual. Okay, a collection of sprains. This is a Eurasian also, uh, a sprain. We find them on the bridges. Um, you, you actually find them at the junctions of uh, a river. Um, this is a culvert, and you can, I could do this for more. There we go. You can, you can see the sprains here. Um, this that nice green area on a river. So to do the sprint analysis, it's really quite a simple. You need obviously the sprain. You need something to put it in. You need something to dissolve it. We use a false the teeth or clean powder. But if you can't get that, you can use biological washing powder. And you obviously need something to look at, like a hand lens, or a tweezers, and a sieve. And what you do is you put the sprains in the container, you put in the biological washing powder or the false teeth cleaning powder, and you leave it overnight, and then you sieve it through the fresh water and that gets rid of all the mucus so you get a perfectly little vertebrae of this fish. And this is a, a sprain that's been cleaned and dried and you can see, you can make out some of the vertebrae here. Now we were quite lucky in our country because we have a guide, but when I did my research in the 90s, I made my own guide. So I used unbaited the fish traps and caught the fish because I was, a, I was eating little small uh, demersal fish, you got to eat them. You could catch your fish here and eat them and then uh, take the bones out.
And these are some of the best of very. And obviously you can look at the sprouts and work out what has been eaten by, by the birds of the There's two ways of analysis. Well, there's actually three I've got in the third one. There's the frequency of occurrence, what the number of occurrence of prey in all sprints is likely to be identified by 20 by the number of all prey items times 100, and that gives you the frequency of occurrence. And then this is one that's the most easily applied, which is the percentage frequency of occurrence with the number of sprays containing in a particular prey by the number of sprays in the sample. When I did my research in the 90s, I came up with random sampling. Well, I, I analyzed like 1,480 uh, sprays, and I just dropped them in the middle. On the one nearest the middle, I identified. And these were the results. And you can see why random sampling is the same system. Um, the same sort of uh, numbers of uh, frequency of care. The limitations, uh, the, the percentage frequency occurrence is the most easily applied sprain analysis method. However, there seems to be little agreement among uh, the experts how to interpret the results. And in our country, three times more sprains are found in the winter than in the summer. In the summer, they seem to sprain in the water. Uh, I don't know if that's the same for your four species here. Only hard bodied prey will be identified in, in the sprains analysis. Our otters love to eat octopus, but that will never ever come out in, in sprains analysis. They also like the livers of the dogfish. It's, it's, we have a dogfish, it's, it's, a, it's have a shark, and they'll they cut the liver out and eat that, and you'll see the dogfish in the shore. Okay, so as I said, only hard bodies of prey will be identified. So any prey item with a large proportion of soft material will be underestimated. There were feeding trials done by Dr. David Cars of the Institute of Terrestrial Ecology in Aberdeen, and they had captive Eurasian otters. And he said the spring analysis overestimate the true proportions by staggering five to two hundred ninety percent and underestimated by 12.5 to 50%. But what spring analysis does it is a really basic thing, but it does always rank the prey in order of importance. So if you start doing anything else other than that, your errors increase and increase and increase. So it's not worth it, but it does honestly rank the prey. And we'll be doing it this, uh, this afternoon. Okay, estimated otter numbers using sprints. We've got a government department called the Environment Agency, and in 2012, they did the recent survey of otters in England. We don't have the Environment Agency in Scotland. And they were saying, they actually published this report, and there's a river, there's a river between Liverpool and Manchester, the river, Ribble, and they found an increase in sprints by 47%, and they said, because we got an increase in sprains by 47%, auto numbers have gone up by 47%. And I think you can't do that. I mean, there's no evidence for it. So, where can be done on Hans truck and chat on saying you can't correlate sprain numbers with auto numbers? So, we thought we'd try it on two coastlines on the Isle of Skye. And this is the Ardennes coastline. I mean, also, if the habits, habitats right where we live have about two, two and a half uh, kilometers of the coastline. And this is our niche, our, our house is, um, this is here. Okay, and this is 
the spring and the okay, I'll just go back. We we surveyed the coast every year. We used we we went out three times a week observing the otters. We put four or five camera traps on each coastline. And we also used uh, two friends. We we do have one or two friends, but these are two friends of the coast. And this is this is the evidence. So we got so, so the spraying numbers, there's actually no correlation between the, the auto numbers and the, the spraying numbers. And this is our niche spraying activity. This is a spraying point is where an otter would regularly drop its uh, uh, sprains. And our niche was also no correlation between active spraying points and And then we looked at Loch Nadal, which was another coastline. You, you can see why it's easy for us to see otters, because uh, we can, do, we can we'll spot them a couple of, well, 21 and a half kilometers along that coast. And we did the same, and we found that the spraying numbers, there was no correlation. With lots of numbers and active spraying points and lots of numbers, there was also no, no correlation. In 1986, research was carried out in Shetland on use of spraying to survey populations of otters. It was concluded again there was no correlation between sprays and the frequency of use of an area by otters. This casts doubt on the use of spraying surveys as a method to assess habitat utilization of otters. And this is a thing, I don't know if you do it in your country, but in our country, we base the basic surveys since 1978 have been done on a 10 kilometer the grid square. So if you go into a 10 kilometer grid square, you're only allowed to walk 600 meters of the waterway. And if you find otters, you put dot. If you don't find otters, you don't put dot. But I, I know from time to time again, there are areas where you do find otters. So that square will become a negative. So the conventional spraying service that they constantly keep doing only tell you otters are there or aren't there, which doesn't tell you anything about otter populations. So I think we have to improve if the methodology of otter surveys and makes it more accurate. So you have to be careful when using sprains and interpreting the results in terms of diet and estimation of populations. Okay, thank you for listening. I want to, just before, I just want to say our spring survey is published in the Journal of Marine Scientists and all the publications on this workshop can be found on, is it Google Drive? Yeah, and you'll get information after. Hello, I have a question. Mm -hmm. So I'm doing research on freshwater fish species mm -hmm. in, in the peninsula of Malaysia. And um, I was wondering if you can use uh, the strengths to identify whether, you know, the authors um, eat invasive species or non-invasive species, or does it tell you all? It, it can you tell you that, it oh, really okay. can, yeah. We, we've used it, we've got, it's nice to watch the locks a long way from the sea, you know, on the sky, we, we were fine looking at the strengths of that, they were using the coast by identifying fish, you know. There's a study uh, from India where they um, realized that the, I think it was the smooth coated otters were targeting more the invasive uh, species of fish than uh, the, 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 the local ones. Um, so I can't remember where I read it, but I, if I can find it tonight, I'll, I'll pass it on to you. It's uh, very interesting.
Thank you, Dr. Paul, for your presentation and your explanation. Now, I would like to invite Ms. Teresa Lubias. As an Indonesia author specialist, he will do intro introduction to the identification of prey class in Indonesia. Please welcome. Thank you very much uh, for this opportunity to show uh, to provide you with some. Uh, uh, I cannot share my screen yet; still disabled. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, so in the next uh, coming minutes, I will introduce you some of the actually quite a follow up from what Paul has just been presented, but uh, we go more deeper a little bit on the identification of the uh, prey remains here yeah, at the other spray. And this is uh, actually an experience that uh, have been done uh, like 20, 30 years ago, actually. And it's uh, the organizer asked me uh, whether I can show them, uh, show all of you uh, my experience during uh, my bachelor thesis here yeah, during that time. And at that time, there is no such thing as, you know, DNA identification and technology. So we go old school, yeah, by creating a reference collection because uh, that's how uh, you will be able to determine. So like, like what Paul said, uh, in Europe or in other countries outside Asia, do we have this uh, guide, yeah, books uh, developed by Jim Conroy and Webb and Watt, yeah, uh, for, uh, for, for identification of prey remains of the spray. But uh, most of the prey, of course, is not from our area, not from Indonesia, even not from Southeast Asia. There are some similarities, but, uh, yeah, as you know that uh, the tropic country has more biodiversity, so it's difficult. So we are challenged uh, when we do uh, prey remain that we should make our own reference collection. And these are two guidebooks that are available. Uh, just uh, it can give you a, a hint of what is the principle of uh, prey remain identification, but then you have to go by yourself to develop the reference. So the, uh, the preparation, like already uh, explained by Paul, you have to preserve your sprains. After you collect it in the field, you have to preserve it. Normally, I use ethanol. And then, of course, uh, uh, when you are uh, uh, back in your labs or in your place, you should clean that uh, prairie man so you can actually see clearly what is it inside. Because if you are aware about other sprains, they look, you know, uh, uh, difficult because a lot of uh, things covering like jelly and stuff. You need to uh, you need to clean that first. Uh, normally, I use uh, 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 washing this is uh, shop, yeah, uh, and stay uh, put it like that. And then you have to build your prey database reference collection. And I think the most important uh, that I learned because during that time I was just by myself and I didn't do proper management of the reference. Uh, so I, I lost it now and even I, I couldn't find it anymore when I tried to look for it. So you have to share it with other people and uh, that also helped you growing up the, the reference itself. And then you go to the reference analysis, of course. Uh, for the sprains preparation, uh, this is the process of cleaning the sprains. You soak the sprains in a washing shop, leave it for 24 hours minimum. This is to dissolve all the digestive materials. And yeah, that's you may aware that otter uh, fortunately has a very high digestive system, unlike any other mammals. Uh, uh, the, 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 what, la, most of the remains of the prey especially the hard part still intact. Uh, only the soft part or uh, flesh that are digestive. 
So this is uh, one of the advantage of uh, identification of other droppings or sprains. Then the sprains need to uh, run to uh, over water in a massive like this and gently rub it with your hands or using glove or things like that. Depends on how uh, secure how secure you want to be on your works. Yeah, uh, this is just to ensure that uh, you don't get uh, what is it uh, any problem uh, health problems. Yeah, and then uh, the, the remain we put in the uh, clean uh, drying uh, paper or in the newspaper, uh, just in the room temperature, and then afterwards to to make it more you know. Uh, Preserve, you can put it in the oven, 60 degrees Celsius uh, for 48 hours. And this is make the bones, uh, scales are strong. Yeah? And then it's sample ready to be analyzed under a binocular microscope or a loop or whatever you have in your site. And then you make this for a uh, prey database. So basically you will have a lot of debris, yeah? a lot of debris from a prey. Uh, so you have to start with a good knowledge on available prey on the sampling site. So if your sampling site is a mangrove, then of course you have to look for uh, either brackish water fishes or brackish water fish, not fresh water fish, of course. And then uh, you have to also what, what else there, uh, like crustacean, uh, insects, small birds, mammals. And if you are especially walking around fish pond, for example, you can ensure that most of the prey will be uh, the fish on the pond itself. So you have to make that prey. What I do is uh, I do some uh, fishing on that uh, sampling areas. And at the same time, uh, I also go to the local market and create, uh, collect some of the fishes there. And yeah, then you can find fish, crustacean, insects, small birds, small mammal, reptiles, and amphibian. This is a possible prey that can be should be covered in the prey database. Uh, if possible, take a fresh sample of the prey species. And if you need to uh, process it later, then you have to preserve it um, most maybe in the formalin or in ethanol. Yeah. And then you make your reference uh, by, uh, like for example, the fish. You I boil it, I boil it, and then uh, I discard all the uh, flesh, of course. Uh, and then we have these uh, different kind of scales and bones, yeah, from the fishes. So uh, for the fishes, there are some things that you have to look for. Uh, for example, this is the middle vertebrae of the fish. Uh, you have to look at the several distinct uh, remarks, yeah, like the top spine, the position of the bottom spine, the angle of the spine, and this is the side goat, uh, uh, the small tips on the spine, and the ridge in the vertebrae, and how they are pointed towards the body. And different fishes has different features. This is some example. I think this one is from uh, a perch, and this one I think is from uh, like a snakehead. I think so. You can see there are some different tips here in the zig, and also on the uh, on the what is it at the end of the vertebrae itself, and they have different shape. These are something that you can uh, collect. Because you know the species already from your reference, this is a, a, a perch, a, a, a carp, yeah, a carp, and this is the, the typical. And then you make a note on that. Uh, oh, yeah, you have to check this part, this part, and then also scales. Yeah, some fish has a large scales, so you can use it for identification. Uh, but some fishes doesn't have scales or very have very small. Uh, scale. So you have to rely on the bones for that kind of fish. Some smaller fishes is difficult to find in other strains like rasbora, you know, the beta, small, small fishes. Yeah? But big fish, you can look at like this, for example, I think this is the carps. And I think this is a different one. You can see there are different uh, scales uh, 
uh, form yeah this one has angulated uh, m this one a little bit rounded and you can see also the uh, what is it the artery yeah, in in the scales other things you can look for is the upper column this is the uh, bone part uh, on the cheek of the of the feces yeah this is sometimes uh, differ in different pieces, but uh, they are not normally uh, consumed by otter. Sometimes otter left the head part uh, not eaten, yeah. but uh, you can definitely found uh, scales and bones uh, of fishes. And sometimes if you are lucky, uh, like for example, if you have a good prey reference for fishes, you can go down up to species level. Uh, I can show you some example later on what I've done. And then, of course, crustacean and brachyura. Uh, yeah, this one is more difficult because, uh, especially, you cannot go to species level, especially if you live in the tropics, because uh, this kind of uh, uh, animal, uh, the identification based on very, very small part. Uh, some are based on uh, mouth part, for example, tiny mouth parts. You have to really look for it. Uh, it's it will be absent in the prey remains of uh, otters yeah uh, but if the if the distinction is in the exoskeleton uh, like for example the claws uh, or the the, the, boat, the shell body or, or some of the uh, what is it spine then uh, you can use that for identification of uh, crustacean and uh, and brachyura or crabs yeah uh, shrimps, normally, if you find uh, a pieces like this, uh, light reddish, not really red, yeah, yellowish or oranges, uh, with a transparent shell, and mostly soft, yeah, you can touch it and you can squeeze it. That's a, uh, that's a uh, uh, shrimps, yeah. But then, if you find a hard exoskeleton and uh, there are a lot of uh, clothes, hardened and normally they turn into reddish or orange uh, color uh, just like when you uh, boil a crab uh, that will be orange and uh, or red that will be a, a, a crab or crayfish yeah a crayfish like this they have uh, long claws but uh, crabs they will have uh, uh, remain like this uh, in the other spreads maybe not as uh, complete like this will be just a debris from this but you can definitely find the tips of the claws uh, on the sprains and the other prey that you can try to look for is uh, amphibian uh, based on the vertebrae mostly they have very distinct vertebrae like this if you look at from the you know the from the front foie view uh, horizontal view. This is the the profile of uh, amphibian vertebrae. They will be different with uh, mammal vertebrae, for example, or uh, 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 birds. Yeah, uh, and of course, birds. Uh, you can find uh, sometimes you can find their feather there, and also bones. Yeah, bones uh, of, of uh, birds normally long and tiny. Yeah? And then mammals, of course, you can find sometimes their fur uh, and bones. Fur are difficult to identify if you don't have uh, a good knowledge on uh, identification of fur using, uh, I think it needs like a, a more fine uh, microscope for that. And then gastropod or uh, snails, you can find uh, the remains of the shells uh the, in our my case is mostly the kiong mas i don't know the uh, akatina fulica uh, and also you can find some insects normally the hard part yeah like the shells the the thorax the legs yeah uh, this is something that you can also develop in your uh preference collection and this is are some of the example of the uh, prey that I found in uh, during my works in 1995 in different uh, type of uh, wetlands upstream river 
in low low wetlands including rice field and then mangrove uh, areas uh, yeah uh, as you can see in the mangrove because some of the mangrove are on the fish pond areas uh, where most people are uh, growing tilapia fishes so the uh, logically tilapia uh, consists of the main this is not uh, occurrence frequency but this is the 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 frequency of uh, occurrence yeah, of uh, uh, of prey on the spring sample and also milkfish uh, are some uh, and then mugili day this is actually interesting the mugili day is a marine species which is not planted in the fish pond but they are fine a lot in quite a lot in the uh, fish uh, so otter spread mostly being kept uh, in uh, so outside of the ponds yeah, near near uh, the uh, of the open sea uh, and then there are one occurrence of uh, baramundi or, or latest species and we found some snake fish mostly in the uh, lowland wetlands and near rice field uh, so that's relevant with the habitat type so it's very small catfish i think this is a brackish water catfish and surprisingly they also consume the mud skippers yeah the gobi day uh, but only very few instances because mud skippers uh, they don't have scales i think i remember and then but they have this thing uh, uh, bones yeah uh, unfortunately i don't have any of their pictures now and there is also eels eels remains uh, not so by so much but they can still found also in mangrove and the lowlands and as you can see i still have uh, some identified fish in here so uh, this need to be uh, refining insects uh, mostly are found in the lowland wetlands i think this is uh, relevant with the habitat which is a rice field uh, rather than in in mangrove where you can predominantly prey on fish rather than uh, uh, other species uh, like this yeah the same with the crabs brachyura they are more relevant uh, in the upstream river in the lowland wetlands and even in the in the upstream river this is consists of uh, mostly uh, of the of the prey of the otters yeah like 80% 87 87 occurrence uh, uh, has been found there and I think this is also largely explained because the fishes in the upstream river are relatively small. They may have not been detected in the prey remains, but uh, the crabs, they are very distinct and uh, abundant. Shrimps, of course, again, uh, very uh, abundant in the mangrove, but also in the upstream river, but less in the rice field gastropod or uh, the shells only found in the in the rice field mammals uh, and snakes yeah even found some snakes uh, scales and uh, bones yeah, on the mangrove uh, yeah that's it i hope that an introduction on and hoping that you can work together with your network friends and colleagues to create your own uh, database reference collection. Thank you. Happy to uh, respond to any questions. Hello, I have a question. Uh, thank you uh, for giving the talk. I just want to ask about maybe you know, the animals, but mostly about the, um, for example, like microplastics. Have you ever encountered, you know, seeing plastic in the, in the space? Can you repeat that? It's not really clear. Okay, so my question is, uh, in regards to microplastics, have you ever seen any plastics in the sprints? And do you see any 
you know, increase or decrease in the presence or absence of that plastic? That, that is my question. So is there any increase and decrease of what? <laughs> Sorry. Uh, difficult uh, to... Microplastic. Maybe Hi, someone can help type on the chat so I can... <laughs> yeah, Hi, uh, but sometimes it's breaking up. Okay, can you hear me now, Reza? Oh, microplastic. Uh, no, uh, especially in the 90s, yeah, probably still not as much as today. Uh, I didn't find, I think, any, what is it, non prey yeah, uh, uh, remains on there. If any, I should put it in a different category, like unidentified non prey remains probably, but I don't see it in my data now. But I suspect, uh, yeah, there will be more nowadays with a lot of trash being thrown into the wetlands. There are no more questions. Thank you, Mr. Reza, for your presentation. Yep, thank now you as well. Now I would like to welcome Dr. Payawarta Mimsawai to present the presentation of estimating population genetics and population size in Thailand.
Dr. Pan, are you there? I'm sorry, it's just screen. Uh, is, is it a full screen? Uh, it, it might be better if you could please play the, the Zoom record uh, that I have sent. The background noise here might interfere during the- Dr. Pai? We can't hear you. Dr. Pai, please I share your screen. Uh, we will share our screen. Uh, 
I'm sorry, would it be better if I do like a voice over those slides? Uh, for example, you, you can show uh, the, the slides and then I, I'll, I'll try to speak it from here, either the, the slides or the, the Zoom records. Yeah, I, I can't seem to get this uh, slide working from, from here. I do apologize. Or uh, let me try one more time. Uh, can you hear my uh, my voice? Okay. It's okay, Adam. Oh, okay. All right. That that's great. Uh, so let's uh, me get started. Uh, this is the work from. Uh, sorry. Let me try to uh, speak louder to uh, make it uh, overcome the background noise. Uh, so from uh, our group is trying to combine the genetics tool plus the camera trap tools uh, to estimate the density and population size of others. And the reason we are interested in uh, genetic diversity is because uh, the genetic threat is often uh, overlooked and we don't know whether the once uh, large contiguous population has now been isolated and split into a smaller size, which might have a lower chance of survival. And we are using the neutral genetic markers because we would like to infer the interaction between genetic drift and migration. But in the future, if you are interested in the phenotype uh, cross with the environmental factors. Uh, I would highly recommend you to go for the adaptive loci as well. But the focus of this talk, uh, we will uh, infer the population genetic diversity of what we see as the patterns uh, from genetic. And then we will uh, try to uh, estimate what is the process that led to the observed genetic diversity. And when we talk about the population size estimations, uh, oftentimes we need a very high mutation rate markers. So in this case, it's the neutral loci uh, microsatellite, which is located in the nucleus. It's a repeated tandem. And this repeat, uh, each of us has different numbers of repeat. And we could use that as an advantage so that first we can identify individuals and letters, identify the paternity or genetic relatedness. And that will lead us to the uh, microsatellite genotype, which will allow us to do the recapture histories. And besides the microsatellite, we can perform uh, molecular sexing based on the sex link genes. And the reason why, uh, the sex ratio is very important. It's because uh, the school ratio could give us as a warning for the demographic trends and the scope of the threat that the populations are facing. And so uh, what we really need right now is the estimate of density, population size, connectivities, so that it will give us a, a priority data, which population uh, we should do the conservation intervention. But the ad disadvantages is that uh, others are quite rare and sometimes is uh, elusive, is active at night. So uh, to identify the high prioritized area uh, with this elusive species, we need to combine uh, genetic plus camera trap data. 
So the objective of this study, uh, led by my friends and colleagues, Dr. Walop Chutipong, is to estimate uh, the density. I'm sorry. Uh, so besides uh, density estimate from the SECR, the spatially explicit uh, capture recapture model, uh, we then going to uh, identify the other corridor based on the genetic relatedness and the level of gene flow. Uh, this is an ongoing process. We don't have uh, yet the data to show you, but here's the study design. If uh, any one of you would like to uh, share your thought or suggestion, please feel free to. So uh, along this uh, Andaman coastal wetland, we have two sympatric species of otters, the smooth coated otters and Asian small claw otters. And sometimes from the camera trap angles, uh, it might be difficult to identify the species and especially the individuals because they have, uh, I like the large fillet, they don't have a very distinct mark, stripe or spot. So to identify individuals and get the capture, recapture history will be very challenging. And uh, sometimes when we look at the scat morphology alone and if they eat the same invertebrate prey, for example, fish, uh, crabs, then we could easily misidentify, especially the crab eating mongoose. We found that oftentimes our uh, patrol ranger collect those instead of uh, otters DNA. But we can first confirm the species using the same markers, the cytochrome B and two uh, control region markers that I mentioned on the first day. And uh, here's the study design. So we first did the occupancy modeling surveys along the uh, light transect where we set up the camera trap. And later on, we identify the hotspot of the latrine site of both species. And then uh, the genetic teams uh, go out and collect the fecal samples along those hotspots with uh, three recapture histories. Uh, what we are focusing on right now is to increase the recapture history. What I mean is that uh, we will recapture or getting the same microsatellite genotypes from uh, the same latrine so that we could improve the accuracy of population estimate so that the confident interval would, would it be too large or we might tend to overestimate uh, the density because uh, microsatellite genotype might by chance uh, are different. It might cause by the genotyping error. For example, if those are heterocycled, meaning they have different alleles from father and, and mothers, but just uh, by chance, uh, this position or this marker gave us the, exactly the same alleles because it couldn't amplify a larger size alleles. We, we call this uh, nose allele amplifications or allelic dropouts. So we are working on reducing this bias from microsatellite genotyping. And by the time we get the genotype table, we hope to estimate the density and then estimate the gene flow very soon. I, I do apologize for the very, uh, very noisy background, but if you have uh, any question, please feel free to post it in the chat box. I'm sorry, uh, or please feel free to contact uh, me or my team. Uh, if you would like to uh, contact me, uh, please use the email account, warata at gmail.com. 
Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Pai, for your presentation. And there are no questions. So um, I would like to invite Dr. Sandeep Sharma to present the author species ID using PCRRFLP technique. Please welcome. Okay, so can you hear me? Hello, yeah. Okay, so I would like to start with thanking the workshop organizer for inviting me for um, talking about this uh, PCR RFLP technique uh, to monitor different otter species that you have in Asia. And uh, it's part of uh, uh, Chiung's master's project uh, where he's uh, trying to develop some methods to monitor otter populations along Selangor coast. Um, so it's just one section. Um, uh, probably he'll talk more about uh, his entire study um, uh, tomorrow. Um, so um, along with uh, Chiung, there were a couple of other students uh, who were uh, a part of this entire study um, in genetic analysis. Um, uh, and Dr. Shamla Ratnayake from Sunway University, she's, uh, she was associate professor there. She um, initiated this work with Chiyong. Okay, so let, let, let me talk something about myself. I work uh, in Germany with uh, a, an institution, government institution called ITIV. It's German Center for Integrative Biodiversity Research, where I uh, work on various kinds of things. My primary focus is on large carnivores. I work in different ecosystems on different questions related to um, several processes that range from DNA, from gene to landscape level. So I look at... Uh, genetic diversity, landscape genetics, population monitoring techniques. I also look at uh, connectivity related issues. And more recently, I'm looking at rewilding options in Europe. Um, this slide, uh, I don't think I need to explain too much about this slide because for last two and a half days, you have been hearing a lot about these Asian otter species and why they are important. Uh, many of them are rare. Uh, one of them is even endangered. So I won't spend much time uh, talking about that. I'll just move on to um, the main topic. So uh, when we started this work, Chiyum told me that there are four species of otters here in Malaysia, but he thinks that there are three species in his study area. So uh, we developed markers for these uh, three species, um, uh, small clawed otter, smooth, coat, uh, smooth coated otter, and hairy nosed otter. Uh, we start with basic question, why monitoring is important? Why do you want to monitor animal population anyway? So I'll ask this question to Chiyung here. Chiyung, why, why did you want to monitor the otter population in Selangor Coast? Um, I guess the answer, straightforward the answer, you know, the otters here is a globally threatened species. We will want to prevent this extinct, like our Sumatran rhinoceros is already extinct, tiger is in a dire state. So we need to monitor, we need baseline data to know what conservation management uh, actions that we need. I guess that's my answer. Okay, so I think he already read my slide yesterday. You, <laughs> <laughs> you want to monitor any animal population or any species population because you want to know the status of that population. You also want to know the population trends, whether they are going up or going down in any specific area or for any specific time scale. It can be the it can be for the entire species, for its entire range, or for any specific population for that case. You also want to know that your conservation measures, whatever you're doing, anti-poaching effort, 
or you're um, you know doing some restoration work, whether they're working or not. So you want to know that you want to evaluate the effects of those conservation measures. And then based on all of this information, you want to make informed management decisions. Okay, so you want to make informed management decisions and that's why monitoring is so important. Now, let me tell you one story. Um, back in 2019, November 2019, before the entire world was engulfed with COVID pandemic, uh, I was invited uh, in a workshop in Taiwan. I'm a member of IUCN's Bear Specialist Group, and they invited uh, several people from Asian countries. So something like this, but what's for uh, bears? And this was the theme there in Taiwan, uh, November 2019. Based on the discussion that we had for three to four days, what we created is Asian Bear Monitoring Expert Team under IUCN's Bear Specialist Group. And uh, I was elected as one of the co-chairs. What we decided there is that we don't know much about distribution of Asian bears. There are five species, including the highly charismatic giant panda, but we don't know about all those other species, sun bears, Asiatic black bears, sloth bear, which is endemic to Indian subcontinent. We don't know about these species at all. So what do we need to do? We need to, uh, produce some information that practitioners, researchers, and conservationists from the entire range country can use. Uh, so two years of effort it, uh, came to fruition just last month, where we published a special issue, completely open access issue. Anyone can go and download and read those papers. Um, special issue in global ecology and conservation uh, about population monitoring conservation of Asian bears. There are five chapters. And these chapters are uh, aligned in a way that you start with uh, understanding the need to step up monitoring of Asian bears. Uh, then you uh, know about different field methods and why they are important uh, for monitoring these bears. Range maps are extremely important, but we know that range maps are often um, uh, not uh, uh, good. Uh, so how can you delineate it? Uh, good range maps that you can use for conservation? And then getting into nitty gritties of statistical uh, analysis. So occupancy abundance relationship, how can you design a study for occupancy analysis uh, to monitor populations? And then at the end, comparison of methods for estimating densities. Uh, so there are multitude of methods that you have now, but which one of these methods are appropriate for Asian bears and where can you use them? So this is one figure from one of those papers. And what you see here is uh, all those methods that uh, the previous speakers in, the, in today's sessions have already talked about. I'm not going into the details again, but what you, uh, when you see here, uh, there are methods like telemetry, DNA-based methods, camera trap, visual observation, science surveys, interviews, and expert opinion. And each one of these methods, they have their own requirement regarding data they have their own uh, issues regarding rigor of the method and the cost. And then uh, lower side, you see area of influence. So for example, so for example, if you are just asking experts, uh, by the way, this is Dave Garshalis, IUCN's Bear Specialist Group uh, lead. So if you ask, ask experts, you can cover a large area because experts will give you information about presence absence of your otters or any other species of concern, but the intensity or rigor is not there. It's not as good as some of these methods like DNA or camera traps. And these methods, visual observation and science, some have fallen in between, okay? So we know that Asian, monitor, um, Asian otters are very difficult to monitor. Why? They are rare. It's very difficult to find them. They're elusive. And then very difficult to track. And I learned all of this thing from Chiung. So we decided that, I decided that let's plot it again for Asian otters. The same problem. You pick up any species, small felids or, you know, um, otters or bears, same problem. So here, DNA methods, telemetry, yes, high precision, high cost. You can only do it in certain pockets. Uh, camera trapping, same thing. Visual observation, science survey, of course you can do it, but you, you can't get much information beyond relative abundance. You can't get density estimates with that. And then interviews and expert opinion. So expert, you talk to him 
and then he will tell you that otters are there in Selangor coast. Okay, fine. You don't have any numbers. You don't have any density estimates. So what do you need to do? Science are really good. They will give you information. So for my master's project many, many years ago, um, although I'm not that old, <laughs> so many, many years ago, I worked on this technique where we tried to identify individual tigers by using their footprint. Um, and Larissa already presented some of the work. So it was those days when we were trying to see if footprints are useful for A, individual identification, and B, we can use them for population monitoring to get density estimates and abundance estimates. Already published that information several years ago, and then we also had, I was talking about this uh, uh, survey uh, that we did um, uh, on the invitation of Government of India in one of the parks in 2005. Um, and we found out that you can actually estimate the numbers, total numbers, and camera trapping actually validated that numbers are comparable. And apart from that, what we have found out that you can, if you have sufficient number of uh, footprints from the entire area and individual IDs associated with that, you can even get information about rough home ranges during your sampling period. So it's really useful information, but there are problems. We replicated that. Uh, and before that, before talking about this, let me talk about replication, which is really important in scientific studies. You can do it in your area, uh, but if you can't do it uh, for some other area, then that information is not useful. That technique probably is not useful. So we need to think about replication because we are talking about large geographic areas in Asia. So in my own case study, um, we did that for tigers. We replicated it for snow leopards because the substrate there is also very good. So in Himalayas, we replicated that with snow leopards. And at the same time, snow leopard trust was doing uh, camera trapping. So we had comparable estimates. But then the story changes. So fast forward 2016, when I was working in Bangladesh, in Bangladesh Sundaban. So what you see here is a, a Google Earth image of Bangladesh Sundaban, 10,000 square kilometer of uh, mangrove forest, contiguous habitat for tigers, about 200 tigers between India and Bangladesh. And those yellow regularly lines that you see are the, um, the riverine stream channels that we surveyed for tigers. Uh, our main aim was to get the density estimate. So we were putting camera traps, we were collecting scats for DNA analysis. But at the same time, um, this team of 130 people who were going there uh, for, for work, they were also looking for signs. And as I had done this for tigers in Indian part, drier part, I was very keen to do uh, something similar on Bangladesh side. And that's where the replicity, uh, replicability uh, matters. So. In Bangladesh Sundaban, what you see is just these blobs uh, for footprint. That means the technique that was superb in Ranthambur uh, National Park didn't work in uh, Bangladesh Sundaban. So what do we do? Uh, so DNA science are now been practicing DNA-based techniques for the last 10 years. And DNA um, provides you a lot of information if you can do it properly. You already heard Dr. Pai's um, talk um, yesterday and today itself. You can get information about individuals, their sex, their uh, relatedness, population diversity, genetic diversity, and lots of other uh, variables. Now, coming to the main point of this talk, PCR RFLT. Now, I'm going to ask a question to the audience to see if uh, you're li listening actively or not. How many of you know about PCR? Just raise your hand. Okay. How many of you know about RT-PCR? Not many? Come on, we live in COVID world. RT-PCR test. Okay, no problems. So PCR, RFLP. PCR part is uh, where you actually make multiple photocopies of the DNA template. So you start, uh, you know about photocopying, right? Xeroxing. How many of you know about Xeroxing? <laughs> Photocopy. <laughs> <laughs> okay. No, I just wanted to know if you know about this or not, and do I need to go into details or not? So, okay, you're making multiple copies. You have your otter, and the otter gave you its poop, uh, its print. You extracted DNA from that, and I assume that you, many of you know about DNA. So you get the DNA, that's the copy of your DNA. That's this template that you start with. 
and they, then you do this wonderful thing called PCR. You are making multiple copies of that, billions and billions of copies of the same thing. So you have this uh, after PCR. And then what you get here is these sequences. So DNA is made of A, B, G, C, these four basic bases. And each base is represented by a different color here. So DNA coming from one species has one color pattern. Let's, let's think about that. And then certain cases, so pay attention here. In certain cases, you have certain bases, certain building blocks replaced by something else. So here it was just L and it was replaced by S in certain cases, in certain individuals, okay? So that's where we focus in RFLP technique. RFLP is restriction, pregnant length polymorphism and don't get bogged down with uh, this name. Uh, I'm going to explain about the technique over here. So you have these three beautiful otter species here and each one of them have their DNA. So this gray line over here is DNA. And right now the change in building block that I talked about, B is replaced by S. S. Something is happening, something similar is happening with these two species, smooth-coated smooth otter and hairy-nosed otter. So let's just assume that there was, some, there, were, there was an A here, which is replaced by B in case of smooth-coated otter. And the same thing is in case of hairy-nosed otter. You have another replacement, in, a, in case of A, it is replaced by C in case of perinose water. Okay. When you do that and you put an enzyme, an enzyme is nothing. Uh, the enzyme is going to identify that specific place of replacement and it is going to cut the DNA from that specific site. So these red, the red points that you see are those specific points. And then you take uh, the restriction enzyme and what you get is these fragments. Okay. So now you end up uh, just by using that one specific enzyme, you end up with different fragments for different species. And that's the technique. So when you run the gel, um, and it's very easy to run the gel, Chiyung had run it multiple times. So when you run the gel, you get one fragment, let, just for example, you get one fragment for one otter species, but for the second otter species, you get two fragments, the third otter species, you get three fragments. So that's what we did. And to design our primers, uh, to design our entire study, the markers and all, uh, we uh, used Dr. Pata's study. Uh, he had published lots of sequences. I think there were 337 samples, including all three species of waters that we have in Malaysia. Along with that, we also scanned. There's this big library of all of these sequences that people generate, open access library, GMAC. So we got the entire mitochondrial genome for all these three species. We scanned that also. And then we developed our own markers. Um, and this is a simple flowchart. By the way, all the samples are collected from uh, North Central Selangor Coast here. Uh, and we are sitting here right in the middle of uh, the study area. Uh, we extracted DNA. Uh, we did PCR uh, that I have already talked about. And we had three markers. So Dr. Pata's study, he used something called D primer, which is part of mitochondria. And the size, remember that fragment, that uh, gray fragment that I had shown you, the size of that fragment in his study was 450 bases. But remember, we are using fecal samples here, which often has very degraded DNA. It's broken down. Uh, so you can't get these long reads. You can't get this long amplifiable uh, DNA from that. Uh, as a result, what happens is that you go out in field, you trudge along the mud banks, you fall down, and you end up collecting, um, let's say, 50 uh, sprain samples. You bring them back to your lab. Again, you uh, work hard for next one week or so. And then what you get at the end, if you're using these big markers, is that you could only amplify 10 samples and the remaining 40 samples are useless. You don't know whether they are from species A, B, C, or civet or dog. You don't know about that. So uh, that's why we designed these other primers that are smaller primers. Um, I mean, smaller amplicon primers. Um, we modified the Tana D primer. To, uh, we call it Tana D modified uh, for the reference. And it's just 200 base pairs. So it's smaller segment. And smaller segments are easy to amplify. 
So the 50 samples that you have collected from the field, there are chances that you might amplify 40 samples. Okay? And along with that, I have also developed this another primer from ND4 region in mitochondria. So don't worry about this ND4 or D loop, uh, this another marker that will amplify 300 bases. And then we did uh, RFLP, the enzymes that cut at specific sites. We scanned through about uh, seven uh, enzymes and eventually we found out that these two enzymes are really good. Just by using that one enzyme, you can identify all three species. And then these are the results. So TANAD modified uh, restriction dilation. Here is uh, your uh, smooth, uh, sorry, uh, this is uh, Aonic Cenarius. Um, this is Luthra, Luthra Gulpa speciata. And this is uh, um, uh, Luthra Sumatrana, Herino's daughter. For three species, you can see that you have different band patterns. So for AC, uh, you have two bands. For LP, you just have one band. For LS, you have three bands. And they are at different locations once you cut them. But the problem with this primer, the modified primer, is that it's also amplifying Paradoxorus hermaphroditus, which is common farm spirit. And uh, it was also amplifying a couple of other small carnivores. The, although the band pattern is different, so even if you have that, you would know that it's from civet. But ideally, it should not amplify other species. It should be specific to autos. That's why we um, designed this ND4 primer. So this is the, these results are from an in silico simulation experiment. And these are the actual results where you can see that this one, this particular sample is AC, uh, MX scenarios. Uh, this, these two are uh, Luthra per species data, and again, AC for these three samples. Let's see the result of ND4. So ND4 is not amplifying civets. Uh, and we found out that with our controlled samples, you also get the uh, band patterns for all these three species. And here you can see a uh, similar looking band pattern in actual lab study. One of the very interesting finding from this is that uh, Chium collected one sample from uh, an area very close to Pete Swamp Forest. And this SC61 sample is actually Herino's daughter. So we know that you can actually amplify Herino's daughter just by, by using one primer and one enzyme. So how to choose the best option? Because you have to do multiple trial and errors. Uh, what are the indicators of the best prime or best combination, accuracy. That's one thing. Second thing, replicability. I already talked about that. And the third is cost effectiveness. And I always give, give stress to cost effectiveness because in Asian countries, often we have shoestring budget for our work. Unlike Western countries where, you know, you talk about millions of dollars. Here we are working on small grants that we get from Rafut Foundation or you know some other foundation, $5,000, $7,000, something like that. So we have to be cost effective. What we found out that our modified primer has high accuracy, it, high accuracy in terms of species identification, 100% accurate. Uh, there's no false positives. So it was highly accurate. And it amplified 97% of the samples that we had collected for this trial. So we collected about 33 samples. And in 97% cases, uh, we could amplify it. In case of ND4, it was 77%. But we have two primers here. We have two different ways to validate our results. Uh, replicability. So till now, uh, we have amplified about 100 samples, close to 100 samples. And we still have the same success rate, um, and there are no false positive till now. And the cost effectiveness, and I love this part because just by spending uh, 7.5 ringgit per sample, you can get all of this uh, uh, results for all three species. Uh, by the way, this uh, this um, calculation does not include the cost of uh, field work. It's just a lab cost. It does not include the cost of a lab assistant. It's just a reagent cost. Okay, so Chium collected about 100 samples. I think the results, these results are only from, I think, 70 samples or so. Um, and here you can see that uh, with that, we can identify all of these uh, otters all along the Selengo coast. I think we are somewhere here. And uh, uh, he surveyed about 80 cells um, uh, for study. Uh, blue is smooth-coated otter, green is uh, oriental small-clawed small otter, and uh, this pink is uh, 
hairy nose rotter that he found close to peat swamp forest. So you can see uh, species identification was easy. Um, and then you map it, you know their distribution. And um, uh, next part of his work, uh, we are going to do the occupancy estimation and uh, a few other things about estimating genetic variation and those things. Okay, so in conclusion, this very simple PCR or FLP technique that we have developed, it's rapid, it's accurate, it's replicable, it's cost effective uh, to identify all three Asian otter species. It is further used in forensic identification of otter pills. If you confiscate otter pills, uh, you can use this because um, it's, uh, you can basically do it in a very simple lab setup. You don't need to send your sample for sequencing, which is often very expensive method. And uh, today morning, somebody from Myanmar, I think, asked about uh, identification of these confiscated uh, otter pups. So if you are not sure what that otter pup is, you just need to take a few hair samples and run this analysis. You can find out the species. Um, I don't know about meat, but uh, I have seen in Africa, they do consume meat of different species. So um, they're also confiscated meat part. You can identify it. Uh, you can also use it in pre-selection of samples for metabarcoding of otter strains for diet analysis. So we had a couple of talks about diet analysis. Metabarcoding is new genetic approach that will give you very highly resolved results about diet of a particular species. And you can use the uh, same PCR RFLP technique for um, identification of the, those otter strains. Okay, so with this, we have lots of plans. I just, I want to leave with a message that we have workshop participants here, enthusiastic, enthusiastic people from entire Malaysia and other parts of um, Southeast Asia. I really hope that you use this technique um, and it's been done in house here in Malaysia, uh, cost-effective, accurate, reliable. And if you have any questions, then you can always approach me. I would like to end up with thanking uh, Perihilitan uh, for granting research permission to Chiung and uh, let us work here. I uh, would like to thank forestry department here, departments of uh, Department of Fisheries, IUC and SSC Otter Specialist Group, Sunway University, uh, International Otter Survival Fund, um, Chiung's supervisor who passed away last year, uh, Malaysian Otter Network, uh, and KSNP authorities. Um, with that, uh, I would like to thank you for your patience. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Paul. You are suggestion for Myanmar. <clears throat> now, my, for me, it is start learner for the otter that's why very so far to me but i will try later and i will contact to you thank you very much thank you thanks a lot uh, uh, interesting talk uh, uh sharma i just want to know uh, especially if we are collecting the springs um and you're going to go out a few days how do we best preserve it for dna work okay so preservation is easy part but you have to done it but you have to do it properly uh preservation wise i think for this study we used ethanol right Achim? yeah we use absolute ethanol yeah so yeah you can use ethanol up to even up to 90 percent ethanol we have also used in other studies on uh, tigers and bears, we have used silica. Uh, so it really depends which area you are working in. Uh, ethanol is good, silica is good. There are other buffers uh, that uh, that can be made or um, you can buy them. Uh, there are multiple options. So in regards to using DNA for identifying species, have you ever considered using eDNA, environmental DNA? <laughs> Fantastic question. And I'm glad that you asked that question. eDNA is uh, a very good approach uh, for at least otter species uh, and, and some of these aquatic mammals and fishes, of course. Uh, I, I'm really keen. I have talked uh, to Chiung and great lens about using eDNA. Uh, what we need is a um, willpower, 
to do that. Um, and then um, not will power, but will to do that. And B is some funding. Uh, so yeah. Fantastic. Okay, so we can think uh, about meta barcoding also because I was thinking about reference library for his work. Yeah, great, thanks. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Sharma, Dr. Santi Sharma, for your presentation. Now we are leaving for lunch break. Um, and I'm expecting everyone to be come back at. Yeah, so uh, so we will head for lunch break. So later we will have few sessions, which uh, I'm very sorry that virtual participants uh, you all will are not, not able to join us. Um, but so for virtual one, um, we will be back online at uh, 5 p.m. So there will be another two uh, presentation or somehow it's a demo showing on the spray analysis that we're going to collect later with the physical participants and also some footprint ID um, that we're going to collect also from the physical participant. So later, virtual will be back online at 5 p.m. Okay. Thank you.